Dr. Mitesh, <clears throat> you will moderate the meeting. So, AJ, Dr. Mitesh will moderate the meeting while I will talk. He has so much, he's uh, electrophysiologist. So he has so much to, we have so much to learn from him today. Now that we're able to get him here uh, amidst all his busy schedule. So Amitesh, it's a real great privilege to have you here after many years of not seeing each other. Uh, today, I can see you one-on-one. -on -one. I'm happy to see you and everybody in the group is also very happy to see you. Uh, yeah. As an electrophysiology, I, we have so much to learn from you on the field of cardioversion and defibrillation today. Uh, I am sure there are, things that, there are things that we are going to raise today that you will clarify us on how those things, what actually did they mean and what's at, uh, those terminology, what did they apply for and yeah. how do we use them? Sure, so we sure, have absolutely. so much to learn from you, sir. You're right. Let's let's uh, you know start now. We'll I'll be more than happy to uh, you know take care of the doubts if there are any. Good. So uh, I can share now. So everybody can see my slides. Good. Yeah. Yeah. So I will be yes, talking yes, in the next. Can. Yeah, in the next uh, 40 minutes on, uh, um, on defibrillation and cardioversion. So, um, Hello. Hello. So the, what we just play is um, uh, it tells us about how the defibrillation and cardioversion goes. So we are going to take time to explain uh, to us in the next uh, uh, 30 to 35 minutes on issues of cardioversion and defibrillation. Now, the first thing I want us to uh, bear in mind is that uh, nobody is born with a bad reading. Uh, most bad reading, they'll end up in, um, uh, in it and it try a uh, death and they don't come up. So the normal pathway for anybody to survive and maintain his normal daily output is from this uh, SNO, the sino atrial node, we generate the impulse and this impulse travel down and uh, activate the, uh, the two atria and uh, converge at the point of the AV node. And at the point of the AV node, there is a delay of about 0 0.1 second and we now move further to activate the, uh, the atrium and we can see here. So this, uh, the, the, the beautiful diagram we see here is just telling us about the physiology of uh, the myocardium, especially the, uh, uh, the, uh, the ventricles, that you have contraction going at various levels, the sodium, one phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, and the rest of them, no time to explain. But here is uh, what I want us to take home on this, diagram is that uh, when you are to cardiovert, there is a window in the, uh, in the cardiac circle for you to do that. And the window is on top of the, uh, the, on top of the, uh, the arrow wave. Now between the Q wave and uh, to the peak of the, of the T wave is the 
uh, absolute refractory period. And that is the point where you can cardiovert and you will not turn that patient to a, a lateral reading that may kill the patient or may put you into more trouble. For example, uh, between the, the peak of the T wave and the, when the T wave uh, 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 elapses and becomes isoelectric is what we call the relative refractory period. Uh, the advice is that don't cardiovert at that point. Was, uh, if you cardiovert at that point, that patient may enter into a, a lateral reading that may be worse than what you saw in the cardi uh, before cardioversion. The reason here is that some of the myocardium have already uh, uh, depolarized and waiting for another, um, another uh, uh, action potential to come. And if you uh, pass in any current, it may activate those myocardium to generate uh, a lateral reading. So, don't cardiovert at that point. Most of the uh, lateral reading in the myocardium, they usually run a loop, and this is one of them. So, in the if you look at the guidelines of the of both the Americans and the European, uh, there uh, in uh, advanced life support, there are indication for defibrillation and indication for cardioversion as CPR and other advanced uh, uh, measures to keep that patient is ongoing. This show mm -hmm. us a very uh, suitable diagram. But uh, suffice it to say that we have uh, two readings that we, cardio, uh, that we defibrillate. These readings are postless, uh, uh, postless uh, ventricular tachycardia, uh, torsi de pointis, and, um, and um, Ventricular fibrillation. These are the readings that we uh, that we defibrillate. Every other reading is either uh, uh, we cardiovert or it is uh, a non-shockable uh, reading. So the incidence of uh, cardiac arrhythmia critically increases, especially among the uh, in the ICU or in the cath lab. You we frequently we encounter them during PCI. Um, uh, during um, uh, during cardiac devices, because I've recorded some cases in the uh, in the cat lab, we're doing uh, we're doing um, a CROT. A while after the uh, in the process of positioning the uh, pro, uh, position uh, into ventricular uh, uh, ventricular tachycardia, and we have to. Uh, we have to shock that patient immediately and continue with our procedure. So we encounter them from time to time in the cat lab. So defibrillation is a non-synchronized ran random administration of shock. Dr. Emmanuel, you're not audible. Yeah, Dr. Edefi. You're not, you're not audible. Yeah. Uh, he has a net, network problem, most likely. Yeah, it looks like he hopped off. We'll wait till he hops back on. <laughs> I guess in the meantime, do we have any questions from the group? Yes. Uh, uh, good evening, all. Good evening. Hey, I'm back. Okay, okay. You're welcome. Yeah. Uh, AJ, can you make me host again? Yes, sir. Just one second. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Good. Okay. So, yeah. So, in defibrillation, you can apply it at any point 
within the QRS complex, why in cardioversion, you have a specific point to apply it. And that is why we do synchronization in cardioversion. Synchronization help you to know that the dots are on top of the QRS complex, uh, on top of the arrow wave in the cardiac circle for you to uh, apply your shock. Now, in the 1956, alternative current were used for defibrillation. But as at later on in 1962, the direct current were later introduced. Today, defibrillation is part of the advanced cardiovascular life support in both the North American and also the European guidelines uh, and every other society guideline today because it saves lives and it has been proven uh, to do so. Now, uh, cardioversion, as we said, refer to the delivery of electric shock that is timed to the peak of the arrow wave on the EKG. So that is how one of the difference between cardioversion and uh, defibrillation. Uh, it's a synchronized, uh, it's a synchronization ensuring that electrical stimulation occur only in the refractory period of the cardiac cycle, not in the relatory that is the absolute uh, refractory period, not in the related refractory uh, period. We should note all those terminology. So uh, over the years, we have we started with what we call the uh, the monophasic, and now we now have the biphasic. I will explain it uh, shortly. But before then, if we are looking at type of defibrillators. We usually, what we have today is what we call the energy-based defibrillator, which send in energy uh, to knock out the rhythm that is there, allow the heart to generate its own rhythm, which probably likely going to come from the <clears throat> sinoatria node. But you also have other uh, form of uh, uh, defibrillators like the epidance base or the current uh, uh, base defibrillator. Maybe later on, uh, Dr. Mitesh will take some time to explain this to us. Then, as we said, we also have the monophasic, which may come in form of damp sinusoidal or truncated exponential. Damp sinusoidal is that when the current goes, it takes gradually, it dies off. It doesn't die off. Um, uh, spontaneously. If the current disappears spontaneously, it is termed truncated exponential. Then we also have, but remember that it's uh, in a uh, monophasic, the current moves only in one direction. It doesn't move to and fro. Why in biphasic, the current goes in from positive to, uh, to negative, then reverses back again. It can also reverse back again. There is also the issue of uh, triphasic, but it's not in clinical practice, and it has not been shown to be better than <clears throat> biphasic. So <clears throat> monophasic and biphasic. Uh, in monophasic system, the current travel, I've said, is only in one direction. Either you use the paddle or, uh, or the pad. Any form of that can give you that. Why in, um, <clears throat> in biphasic, the current travels from positive to negative and reverses back. And in biphasic, we use smaller amount of energy compared to the monophasic. So with monophasic, the rate of first shock as success is around 60, while in biphasic, the rate of first shock success uh, uh, rises up to 90. Reason because of it travels and return back and it can also return back again. So these are the benefits. We have various types of defibrillators in the market. We have number one is the AED. The AED, um, that is the uh, external, automated external uh, 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 defibrillators. The automated external defibrillator, the first set that we are actually uh, in the market, we are the monophasic. But nowadays, most of the ones that, you are, that are valuable now are the biphasic that are valuable. Now, <clears throat> What happened about this is that they are not actually developed for the doctor. Only. They, are not de they are developed for the layman. They are developed for the marketplace. They are developed for the offices. They are developed for the industry so that you can do something before the paramedic gets there. That is why you notice that they are everywhere 
in town. It is, uh, they can be found in marketplace, can find in air, supermarket shops and the rest of them. Reason that somebody had um, a sudden cardiac arrest, you can just place the part and it, it directs you on what to do. Then the, the, the ones that are fully automated does the work itself. Why the ones that are semi-automated, -auto you need some assistance of the bystander to press on the button to help you and uh, to, uh, to give the shock. But it's also direct you, it reads, uh, those, this one reads and they talk back to you. Is it a shockable <laughs> reading? Is it a not shockable reading? It gives you all that and you move on with them. So these are some of the reading we just looked at. First is the normal sinus reading. Second, you see monophasic uh, ventricular tachycardia. If this patient is in a, uh, is in, uh, is in a, a cardiogenic shock, go ahead and shock the patient immediately. You also have a ventricular fibrillation, shock the patient immediately. Then you may also have premature ventricular contraction, or you may also have atrial flutter. If atrial flutter or atrial fibrillation, if the patient is in a, <clears throat> is a, a hemodynamically compromised, cardiovascular patient immediately. So there are reading that will apply cardiovascular, some reading will apply uh, defibrillation. Now, the current um, uh, European and the American uh, uh, guideline says that for atrial fibrillation, you cardiovert, you can start with 120 to 200, uh, to 200, you start at a lower, and if that does not work, you escalate it, you raise it up. The atrial flutter, you can, you, you can start with 50 to 100 and escalate it. While ventricular tachycardia, you, if it is a patient with a pulse, pulse ventricular tachycardia, you can start around 100 for bi, uh, biphasic, 200 for uh, monophasic. While ventricular fibrillation and uh, pulse-led ventricular tachycardia, you start around uh, 150 to 200 for biphasic and uh, 360 for monophasic, if that is what you have there. Then for the external, uh, automated external defibrillator, let's just pay a little time on it. So this term, as we said, is actually developed for the, uh, for, the, for the community, for the larger population. So both paramedics and the layman can make use of them. Just it requires little education, especially the ones that are uh, fully automated. You just place the pad, tell you the position of the pad is written on that pad, you place it and it gives you the work, analyze the reading and gives you the work. So for those that are semi-automated, as we said, you require an assistance of uh, the bystander to press the button, but it gives you the analysis, talk to you, the, uh, is it a shockable reading, apply shock, then you apply shock. But the question is that it gives you a little timing before you can do that because you require a human effort to, do, uh, to press on the button. Then uh, it's also being used by the paramedics uh, because they are trained to go to, into the community and get this patient while transporting them to the hospital. They can use that and apply shock when necessary. Then for the fully automated, it's mostly by the bystander. You don't require much, but the problem here is that when you are doing CPR, bystander is doing CPR, it can give a shock and the shock may coincide with somebody doing CPR at the same point. That is one of the disadvantage of that. So, you can see the one that is uh, semi-automated, the parts are uh, fully applied and it talks to you. Once you're on the machine, it gives you the guide, it talks to you, then you apply the part, one at the right side, just below the, uh, the right clavicle, the other at the apex, around five, uh, six, or uh, mid axillary line, that you apply it around there and the short pathway goes between the two uh, part that this is a, a, a manual defibrillator. Uh, you want to defibrillate, you can still use the same pathway to defibrillate uh, that patient. So, what are the indications for cardioversion and defibrillation? One is that for you to defibrillate, you require those uh, two reading um, a postless electric, uh, a postless ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation because. There is nothing going to the brain at that point in time. So start your CPR, defibrillate, and continue your CPR until that patient has normal sinus reading. Then uh, if a patient has AF and uh, or atrial flutter or 
uh, etra, um, 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 what we call um, atrioventricular uh, reentry tachycardia or uh, AV nodal uh, reentry tachycardia uh, with pre excitation pathway or monophasic uh, regular uh, tachycardia with a pulse, you also need to shock them if they are in, uh, if they have hemodynamically compromised or you try chemical cardioversion, it did not work, then you have to try electrical cardioversion. For defibrillation, it goes for, uh, for pulseless ventricular tachycardia, uh, uh, ventricular fibrillation, and uh, torsi depointes. So all these are readings that we address in the cat lab or in the ICU. And while that is going on, CPR must also go on with them. But suffice it to say that it is not only in the acute, especially when you are talking about these supraventricular um, uh, tachycardias, there is, uh, for AF, if you try, if AF is, um, is, is, is um, has been long and you try uh, chemical cardioversion and it did not work, and you have adequately uh, um, uh, anticoagulated that patient um, with your transosophageal echo done, you can also attempt that patient to cardiovert them, whether they will go into sinus reading. Yes, I have done many of uh, some of that, and we have had some good sources from ventricle uh, from uh, AF who had uh, who, who didn't respond to chemical cardioversion, but they responded to um, uh, to electrical uh, cardioversion, especially when the atrium is not that big, less than five cm. Uh, five uh, five cm. They uh, they respond uh, well to that. Okay, so ability to recognize is very important. So that is CG and also to recognize this issue of this reading and know when to apply cardioversion or when to apply defibrillation is very, very uh, important. And the earlier we do it, the more success we give to that patient in terms of survival. Because the more we delay, the less chances of having success for such group of people. So for atrial fibrillation, let's just take a few minutes to talk about it. There are various types of atrial fibrillation. We are not going into that, but my emphasis on this talk today is on, is it an acute or the atrial fibrillation has stay for some time? If it is an acute and the patient is hemodynamically stable, you can try your uh, chemical cardioversion with your beta blocker, your amiodarone. These are the two agents we have here. But if you are to do cardioversion on AF in acute setting, you have to use your IV beta blocker. But in the Nigerian setup, because the aim of this presentation, the aim of this group is for us in the sub-Saharan Africa to know what we have and to make use of what we have and know where our deficiency is. We don't really have uh, commonly uh, the, the IV beta blockers among us here in, in Nigeria. What we have here is more of amiodarone. We have the IV amiodarone everywhere, but IV beta blocker, we don't have them that we use for cardioversion, not labetalol. We're talking about um, uh, metoprolol IV. We're talking about bisoprolol IV. We're talking about, we don't have those medications around here, but we have the oral form. So we can still attempt the oral combined with amiodarone, and it gives us some, some, some form of uh, success. And if you try that, you do that for a while, and you, you, um, you, you anticoagulate that patient to ensure that that patient doesn't develop a clot, and you come back to cardiovascular that patient, you have its chances of having some success, especially when the, uh, the atriums are not that uh, very, uh, very uh, large. So you can have some success with that. So this is, uh, if, um, I got this, uh, this ECG from, um, 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 Life in the Fast Lane. That is where I got it from. So the reading here is uh, uh, a fine AF, uh, an AF, and this patient uh, is um, um, uh, 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 hemodynamically compromised. What do we do? We just have to cardiovert. Cardiovert. 
and apply your medication and move on with it to see whether the patient can be helped. So we also have atrial flutter. The treatment of atrial flutter and that of AF are similar in the guideline. It's still the same thing we do for them. But uh, when the electrophysiology we talk, it will give us some more insight on the issue. Now, cardioversion of uh, AF doesn't mean that the patient may not reverse back to, uh, to AF because I've seen it, or uh, flutter doesn't mean that the patient may not reverse back to flutter again. So if that happens, what do we do? Then these are where electrophysiology comes up. You can ablate uh, 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 the, uh, the, uh, the pulmonary, uh, uh, the pulmonary uh, uh, veins, where most, which most time is the source of the AF, or ablate around the source of uh, the atrial flutter so that you'll be able to keep that patient in sinus as much as possible if the need arises. Now, for narrow complex uh, tachycardia, including atrial flutter, uh, um, atrioventricular, not uh, a reentry tachycardia, uh, atrioventricular reciprocating tachycardia or junctional tachycardia, once they are hemodynamically unstable, the, uh, the guidelines say cardiovert them straight away and cardioversion is recommended for them. But if they are hemodynamically stable, you can try chemical cardioversion with uh, the beta blocker, the amiodarone, uh, the, uh, the antiarrhythmic agent. You can try that first. And if that don't work, then why doing that, you also anticoagulate that patient. Why that didn't work, then you can think of cardioverting. But there are some centers that whether they are hemodynamically stable or not, they try to cardiovite to see whether the patient. But the issue here is that if you are cardiovating anybody that is fully conscious, first you have to sedate that patient to ensure that uh, the patient is not fully uh, conscious. Then two, uh, you have to also apply a jet to the part so that uh, the, en uh, the energy you're applying doesn't burn the, uh, the skin. So this is a, a, a fast, a slow, fast, a typical AV uh, nodal re-entering uh, tachycardia. Then here we also talk about similar thing here. Then we talk about the uh, monophasic uh, uh, ventricular tachycardia with a pulse. In monophasic ventricular tachycardia with a pulse, what, what the guideline recommend is for us to, um, is for us to cardiovert, not to defibrillate. So we still use the lower energy synchronized and cardiovert uh, the patient. So you can see that it's a monophasic because most of the, uh, the arrow waves, most of them are all uh, similar in, uh, uh, in amplitudes. So it's monophasic. This is also another monophasic, yeah, similar and all pointing towards one direction, maybe probably pointing that is coming from one source. Then uh, for patients with ventricular fibrillation and pulseless ventricular tachycardia, the treatment in the guideline is similar. Defibrillate that patient, continue your CPR, continue your medication until you restore that patient to sinus and follow, it, follow the patient up during the recovery to ensure that that sinus reading continue. This is a polymorphic uh, uh, ventricular tachycardia, a uh, reason being that you can see that how many minutes remain? Is it up to 40 minutes, sir? Moderator, nine sir. Nine minutes, fine. I will finish so that we can discuss in detail. So, this is a uh, monomorphic ventricular uh, tachycardia. Uh, reason being that you can see that the arrow waves are different morphology and uh, different amplitude than the rest. So this is another, uh, yeah, uh, to side the point is polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. So after cardioversion, uh, sorry, this is, uh, this is one of the readings that we must wash out for. That was why I brought it here. Why should we wash out for it? The uh, arrow on T phenomenon. So there is a sinus reading with a frequent PVC. So when you see this type of, this type of ECG, on a 24 hour uh, halter, or you see it on, uh, on a patient, on a monitor, wash out for that patient because that patient 
is on the verge of entering into either a VTAC or a VF, very common, arrow on T uh, phenomenon. This is another patient with uh, torsi de pointis. Um, yeah, so this is the post chalk and uh, what we saw here. Then you can just listen to this video. Uh, sorry. Let me go back to it. You just carry those. That's like some of me carry those. Stay close. Just hold that up and down. Okay. Let me just go where that um, trouser is. Let me see. Just keep eye on what is this a sinus reading on the monitor. Suddenly, the patient degenerated to ventricular fibrillation. So that is what I wanted to show there. So this tells us the various unstable uh, 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 ventricular, sorry, unstable atrial plot and um, atrial fibrillation uh, used about 120 to uh, 200 joules on the uh, biphasic uh, defibrillator. Oh. For monophasic, this is the recommended and is synchronized. Then for uh, v, uh, VF and postlet ventricular tachycardia oh, is always unsynchronized. Use oh, 360, 200 to 360 while you start with uh, 120 and graduate up in uh, biphasic uh, uh, defibrillator. Oh, these are the things that I want us to pick up uh, today. Now, the next thing is that, how do we prepare the patient for cardioversion? For those that are fully um, uh, awake, uh, the guidelines say just sedate them. If you have midazolam, diazepam, just uh, sedate them. But in the, uh, where there is an anesthetist and the anesthetist can give you a support, then the anesthetist can administer a proper for, but it has to be done under the guidance of an experienced anesthetist. But if in a situation you are in the cat lab, there's no anesthetist, we have a midazolam, we have a diazepam, you can give that then, you go ahead. Uh, but for patients who have a VF already, they are already unconscious, you don't need um, this medication. Or a patient who already had a pulseless uh, ventricular tachycardia, uh, you usually see them already unconscious, so you don't really need uh, this medication before you go ahead. So apply your your pad, your 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 pads or your paddle, apply them appropriately. There are two way you can have two recommendation. One is at the one recommendation is that you place it at anterior lateral. That is one recommendation. Why the second recommendation is posterior lateral? Posterior lateral is this one that I, this, this is a posterior lateral. This is recommended for one, uh, those that have ICD or a devices, the, uh, uh, the guideline recommend this, or those that, uh, that are uh, 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 pregnant, the guideline also uh, recommend this. They also suffice it to say that if you are using a, if you are using a, a biphasic def uh, defibrillator, the one, the energy is smaller compared to a monophasic two. The energy is mainly between the two parts, the two parts. That is where the energy uh, mainly stays along and traveled along. It doesn't scatter the way a monophasic uh, scatter. So it's better also for pregnant uh, 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 women. So CPR before cardioversion is very important. Number one, it sends uh, blood to, to the brain uh, and oxygen and glucose to the brain and also uh, send blood to the myocardial during CPR. Why? And that also enhances your defibrillation and cardioversion. Uh, studies have shown all that. So ap uh, application and delivery of cardioversion follow uh, the, fo the step. First, you press on the button. Once you press on, on the button, then the next thing is that apply the uh, the ECG, apply the ECG and look at uh, the, the reading appearing. Then also uh, the next thing you will do is uh, press the energy and select the energy that you will use. Then the next thing is that you press your synchronization. Then your synchronization, uh, how do you know that the synchronization is on? It gives that button, uh, gives you a dot on top of the, uh, top of the arrow waves. 
Then after that, you press your charge. Then you charge, wow. after, once the charge is complete, then you wow. go ahead and you card your vat. But uh, in defibrillation, you don't synchronize. So that is the pathway that we follow to do that. So once that is done, the patient is cardioverted or defibrillated, it return back to sinus reading. And once the sinus reading is returned to, then you place the patient on recovery position, still be on the look and watch that patient and ensure that the patient doesn't go back, continue the patient on medication and ensure that the patient uh, doesn't return back. Then uh, we talked about uh, use of cardioversion or defibrillation under spe uh, special circumstances like pregnancy or people with cardiac devices. Yes, you can do that. So among various uh, um, uh, people that are pregnant, you can do that. But as we said, use that, um, the guideline recommend more of anterior posterior, not anterior lateral for pregnant. Uh, then two, um, if you have uh, a biphasic, biphasic are preferable. Then uh, three, um, sedation is also very important uh, to them. Then for ICD or for any devices, uh, we also said that you can also do that, but avoid where the, uh, the post generator is. So anterior posterior is also very important for them. If they are fully conscious, uh, you can also sedate them before you go ahead with the procedure. <coughs> so can there be any complication from uh, cardioversion or defibrillation? Yes, there can be complication. One, you, uh, myocardial loss can occur. <coughs> myocardial injury, skin injury can also occur because of uh, maybe probably not applying enough adhesive uh, to the skin. Okay, uh, I think this is the summary of my presentation today. Uh, it's now time to discuss uh, it's good we have our guru here, uh, Dr. Mitesh, who will take us on the discussion. Yeah, uh, Dr. Emmanuel, I would like to add a few points uh, before we before we go to the doubts. See, uh, there's a there's a vulnerable period in the relative refractory period, which is the reason we look for sinking. I think as in the sink, yes. uh, maneuver. Now, what happens is. If you, for, for a VF patient, it doesn't really matter because the rhythm is already wavered. But on patients who have a yes. re-entry phenomenon, as it's called, the re-entry phenomenon. So those people, if they're given a shock without sync, then what happens is those patients who are in a tachycardia can turn into VFs. You degenerate them into VFs. That's the reason that you do cardioversion with the sync on, that's called synchronized cardioversion or defibrillation. Yes, as you would call. correct. Now, this timing is something somewhere between 80 to 100 milliseconds before the T and around 50 milliseconds to the T. So this is the vulnerable period. So if you are able to do the, you know, your, your defib machine has that sync part, then it's very easy. But otherwise, you can actually observe, take it along with that notion that those seconds are important. One. Now, when you have an underlying device, you need to be around eight to 10 centimeters away from the device. From the device. device. Yes. Yeah. Correct. So either it's a pacemaker, or it's ICD, it's a CRTD, whatever it is, you'll be around 10 centimeters away from it and you'll be done. So the reason the anterior posterior uh, paddling location is important is because sometimes what happens is we are looking at rhythms in, emanating from the left atrium. The left atrium being a little posterior gives you that leverage that you take care of the left atrium as a whole. So the energy which goes from the sternum part, sternal area to the scapula takes care of okay. that particular aspect of the left atrium. So you can try to revert a atrial rhythm to uh, a normal sinus rhythm. Now, Good. coming to the usual atrial suspects, 
the AVRTs and the AVNRTs. You should always, until unless they're hemodynamically unstable, you usually don't follow a, you know, cardioversion sort of a thing. It's usually either adenosine or, you know, calcium channel blockers that we usually try. But as soon as the, you have a BP systolic going to less than 90 millimeters, you are supposed to shock them as well. These rhythms, the AVNRTs and the AVRTs, they do respond well. But when it comes to any tachycardia, which is more junctional, they don't mm. respond. So that's why something like a paroxysmal junctional reentry tachy, PHARTs or junctional tachys, you don't, you don't cardioward them. Now, when you have devices, you know that the patient is in AF or whatever. So, in for example, in a CRT, you want more than ninety-five percent pacing. So in these cases, even if the patient is not symptomatic for any reason, you can you know ask the person to come over because the CRT is not doing its bit. So you 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 prepare them, get a transesophageal echo, rule out a LA clot, and then cardio them. So that takes care of the real aspect of a CRT, which is to pace as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of points I really would love to make, but I can I I think uh, uh, there's a there's a question in the chat box about uh, to you, to Dr. Emmanuel, that you know do you do you pace uh, rhythms for uh, do you overdrive them uh, to pace terminator it will start up with device. So uh, yeah, you want to take that call? Uh, should I? Yes, you can you can make your contribution, but I what I wrote there is yes. If that patient had a device, you can overdrive that piece, you can overdrive, and if it doesn't work, then you can prepare the patient. And as you said, uh, if we have a transesophageal echo first, because one, you must you should know the duration of that reading. And if the duration is long, you want to be sure that the patient doesn't have um, a clot in the uh, in the early appendage. And if that is there, you have to anticoagulate the patient uh, for a while and repeat the trans osvaja echo. And um, if it's not there, then you can go ahead and uh, cardiovar uh, cardiovascular. Uh, with a, uh, electrical cardioversion, if you have done your your overdrive pacing and it didn't work, but the question, uh, what I want to also add to that question is that uh, it's not every pacemaker that had that that uh, that software to give you uh, overdrive pacing. And uh, I know in India you have all uh, all the generations. And the latest generation is with you, dear. But here, uh, the what we have before now, or what is being sold to the Sub-Saharan Africa, is uh, Sensia, and lately we now start having Sphera. The Sphera we are getting here don't have that ability to overdrive mm -hmm. uh, uh, pacing. So if you have a device that cannot give that, then you still resort back. Mm -hmm. To the yeah to the uh, to the, what we are saying of cardioverting them uh, electrically or you use the usual pathway to follow, so it's still the same thing. But uh, Azure adapter, Azure, uh, these are Medtronic various uh, uh, devices. They have this uh, this algorithm mm -hmm. in them where mm -hmm. you can overdrive uh, the atrium and <clears throat> give you success sometimes. But these devices are not sold commonly here. Yeah. This is where my issue is. Mm. So over to you, I'm, uh, Dr. Mitesh. Yeah, you've, you've, uh, you've brought out a valid point. It, it is all about the, the capability of the device as well to pace terminate. It's usually with, uh, you, know, um, you know, the ventricular rhythms in ICDs or uh, CFD, yes. which you are able to do a little better than the usual atrial pacing from a from a from a pacemaker point of view. Yeah, it's pretty pretty valid from your side as well. Good. Um, yeah. Uh, if if there are any questions, we'll be happy to take. Yeah. Thank you very much. Good evening. Good evening. 
Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Edafe, for wonderful and the good teaching. Um, I have a couple of uh, question and need for clarification. Number one, uh, it is clearly explained of when do we uh, defibrillate? That one has been very clear, but it's not very clear of when to cardiovascular instead of defibrillation. So we need a repeat and more clarification of when to cardiovat instead of defibrillation. Number two, um, uh, we learned that uh, during the cardioversion, we use the sink mode. We turn the sink mode, and then when we see the dot appear, appear on the other wave, then we shock, isn't it? So, um, if there is, a, it means those without the sync mode, we cannot cardiovert if the defibrillator has no sync mode because there are olden days defibrillators and the, some of the monopathic that they don't have the sync mode. So that means we cannot cardiovert with that one or that is a way, even if they don't have sync mode that we can cardiovert. Then number three, I learned that somebody, um, I learned, it, was it last week or last week, that um, some of the puddles, they can be used to trace ECG without even need of you to attach the, the ECG cables. But you can use the puddle, the moment you touch the patient with the puddle, then the ECG will appear. But I know that the ECG that we have commonly you have to attach the leads before you start seeing the rhythm and then you take action. But is there any modern one that when you attach the puddle alone without the um, uh, ECG cable, you will see the rhythm going on and then you take decision? So these are my three uh, questions or need for clarifications. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah, Dr. Amitash, you want to yeah. take some, then I take yeah. some. Yeah, Good. so let me take the third one first. See, uh, the earlier devices, those who had paddles, if you just keep the paddles, for example, a patient has come to the emergency with unconsciousness and you suspect that it's a lifeless VT or a VF. So if those machines are with those, those paddles are kept on the, on the, in the anterolateral side, as in, the, the close to the sternum, the, the left one, the right one close to the apex, they can actually show you a single lead ECG on the monitor. That's good enough for you to shock the patient if there is a hemodynamic compromise. So the need for ECGs and all, and all the preparation sometimes is something that is pretty elective. But you have machines which have only the paddles giving you a just the ECG, a single lead ECG to take care of the shockable rhythm. Thank you. Yes. Thank and you yeah, very much. Then, yeah. Coming, your, to, coming, yes. coming to coming to the cardioversion part. Now, you know, cardioversion is again something that is both emergent as well as elective. Now, if you have a patient of atrial fibrillation or atrial SATA coming to you with a BP of 80 oblique 60, he is feeling dizzy, he's sweating, he probably is going into a breathless mode or perhaps into a heart failure, you don't have time to prepare something. Now, this is the patient who you can cardiovert. Why? Because first, as a, as a, as a, as a person who knows what the ECG looks like, you can take a call. Now, in these patients, what you need to remember is once you've seen the, the rhythm and you know that it's a atrial rhythm which is causing all the compromises, you can go to the sync mode, go for the charging and, you know, revert it if with the first shock and if required with the other shocks, whatever be the need. Now, if you are looking at a patient who is immunodynamically compromised, you don't want to give more than one or more than two shocks because the rhythm you need to revert as early as possible. So that's when you do a 200 joule biphasic or a 360 joule monophasic, whatever be the machine available to you. So you cardiovert 
patients of atrial rhythms, you defibrillate the patients of ventricular rhythm. Now, ventricular rhythm means the patient either with a monomorphic VT with hemodynamic compromise, a polymorphic VT with hemodynamic compromise, VF with hemodynamic compromise. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this clarification. And I, I so, forgot your second question. What was the second yeah, question? The, the second question was that if you have a defibrillator that has no sync mode, yes. can you cardiovert or it has to be the one with sync mode? Yes. So most defibrillators as of now, or perhaps even the, in the last 20, 25 years, have that sync mode. The sync mode was specifically meant for, for the technical reason that with the same machine, you can both cardiovert and defibrillate. So when it was made, it was made to see the ECG on the monitor and put, take it as if you know you can do the sync part, sync mode, whenever you require. Thank you. Great food. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So in addition to what uh, Dr. Amitai just said, you know that um, AED is a defibrillator, but is yeah, uh, it's an automated external defibrillator. Then the ones where yeah, they yeah. have the sync mode are the manual defibrillators. Yeah, yeah. Now, the manual defibrillators, they uh, they can have a, a paddle. They can also you can also organize them and uh, plug them to a pad, not the disposable uh, pad. The paddles are those and your like handles that you hold, you can rub them on its uh, rub uh, surface on rub um, gel on the surface and apply it. Why the parts are uh, those adhesive uh, electrodes that you can apply disposable, you use once and you throw away. So this manual defibrillator, which can function as a defibrillator can function as a cardioverter, uh, can also function as a sub uh, uh, cutaneous pacing. You can also have used it for pacing. The, it has all these modes. And also, you can also use it as a monitor. You can also use it as a monitor. It gives you all those functions. But for the, the, um, the AED, AED is only meant for defibrillation. It doesn't do, AED does not do the work of cardioversion. And yeah, there are two yeah. readings which we have, uh, we have explained that it does. Thank you. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah. More questions, more questions. Thank you, Dr. Nazi. Great, great, great yeah. time. So, uh, uh, Dr. Edafi, that yes. means, um, we should be counseling the uh, policymakers and the administrators when they are purchasing those machines. They should be uh, they should contact the end users and the specialists, for example, to get the machine by phasing, think mode, and the pacing modes. So this is the best defibrillator. It has the pacing mode. It ha it is by phasing. And the um, uh, it it synchronized. So, uh, but sometimes you see the policymakers and the administrators. They just go and get contractor and bring monopasic, no patient mode in it. And the, uh, you have to work with what you see in the hospital, and it doesn't all go well. So I think we have a work to do to convince them. Always consult the specialist. Yes, I agree with you. Uh, no, no, no issue. All manual defibrillator has all that. The PC mode, yeah. uh, the defibrillator, all manual defibrillator, I think they have it. It depends on the manufacturer. It's feeling, mm. uh, biotronic, uh, what have you, all of them, they have it. Uh, mm. All of yeah. that we prefer by PASIC, the monopasic. Yes, correct. Okay, yes. Okay. Yes. Um, can I just um, add contribute to the third question I was asked regards Correct. the ECG? Thank you, sir. Um, 
So you asked about ECG, or you mentioned that the ECG, you can get your ECG by placing the paddles on the patient. Yes, that yeah. is very correct, but it depends on the settings of your defibrillator. So it depends on if your defibrillator is programmed or set up to um, extract ECG from just the, car, the ECG cables, you would not see uh, depending on the model too and the how recent it is, you might not see the ECG when you place the paddles. So you have to okay. either set it auto so that it will select whether it's the paddle or you connect the ECG cables, whatever is connected, or it is even the pad, whatever gets connected from the defibrillator, either the ECG cables, the paddle or the pad, it will show you at least a single lead ECG which you can work with. So that depends Thank on you. how you set the, the defibrillator. Just want to mention that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is yeah. valuable contribution, actually. Thank yes. You. Thank cool. you, sir. So more, more questions, more talk. We have talked about defibrillation, talked about cardioversion in, uh, in our everyday work. We encounter this uh, issue. We encounter them. So let's ask our questions to clarify them. So uh, before uh, anybody puts in a question, let me give a few more uh, insights now. Good. What is, what is meant by a successful shock? Now a successful shock is a term which is used that after you've shocked a rhythm and the rhythm doesn't return within the next five seconds is considered a shockable rhythm. Now, it can happen that the rhythm returns after 10 seconds, but that doesn't mean that the shock was unsuccessful. It's just that the shock is recurrent. Uh, the rhythm is recurrent, one. Two, now in patients, sometimes what happens is after you give them a bit of sedation and you uh, anesthetize them, you've brought back the rhythm but the patient goes into a sleep mode, you know, as in it doesn't wake up. So that's again a complication of anesthesia. That's why they say that whatever you choose as an anesthetic agent should be based on whatever the clinical profile the patient has. Now, if the patient is elderly, you might not be looking at too much of mirazolam or too much of dizepam. You might be looking at just a bit of analgesia by a, a small dose of fentanyl and you are done. Because what you want to do in a patient who is cardioverting is you don't want them to remember the pain that they might have because of the shock that you give them. In such cases, a small dose of any agent will do, which just takes care of the next few minutes while you are providing a, 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 a 100 joule or a 200 joule cardio, cardioversion. Now, when we talk of pain, so after 50 joules till about 200 joules, the pain almost is the same. The only time the pain might be less is when you give a 25 joule, which is usually the cases when you are looking at something like an atrial flutter. But otherwise, you shock them with a high energy because you don't want to shock them more than once or more than twice. Now, Dr. Emmanuel talked about IV beta blocker and IV uh, amiodron, but you know, uh, there's something called pill in the pocket. You have oral agents which take care of the rhythm, the AF part. It's called, it's a combination of flaconide and tocopherol. pretty much available these days. That is one aspect. The second aspect is something called an IV, IV light. It is also being available. It's called, it's for chemical cardioversion. You can try it first after you've ruled out a clot and you can think of a chemical cardioversion before doing a mechanical cardioversion. The success rate is pretty, pretty okay although uh, it's not available everywhere, but you can have that. So a patient who is planned for a cardioversion has to be anticoagulated for at least three to four weeks prior to an elective cardioversion. And after the cardioversion has been successful, it should be continued with at least four weeks. Rest of it, do you continue after four weeks? Anticoagulation is more dependent on what the rhythm stays. So that's why you work uh, a workup of the patient in terms of a whole tower or ECG and you know stuff like that. You should continue with it till you are pretty sure that the AF has not come back or you've taken care of it. Now, once you see the LA size on an eco, you can actually decide if your 
cardio version is going to be successful, but everybody should be given one chance at cardio version. And LSI is between 4 to 4.5 to 5.5 is just about okay. When the LSI increases to more than 5.5, you're probably looking at a recurrence in the, in, the, in, the, in the coming few weeks or months. So the higher the LSI is, the more chances that the cardio version might not be effective enough for a long period of time. Now, anticoag, if you have uh, uh, atrial fibrillation pre-acute, you know, in, in, the, in the last 48 hours, it was not there, now it has come up, then you don't need to anticoagulate the patient. You can straight away go to the cardio version part and probably continue anticoagulation later. But if it is more than 48 hours, then you probably need to confirm, either give, if it's an elective, you give him four weeks of uh, anticoagulation, then cardio, or you get a transesophageal echo to rule out clots inside the heart, especially the left atrial appendage or the left atrium, and then plan cardio. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, this arises a uh, need for one or two clarification, if you won't mind, sir. Yeah, no problem. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, the, the first one, uh, how many cycle of the fibrillation are we allowed to do for us to yeah. call it a day as fell cardio, uh, fell defibrillation or fell cardioversion? That is not the first question. And then the second question, when you have fell defibrillation, what do you do next? See, uh, every time you cardiovert or defibrillate, you are actually stunning the myocardium. So they say that even if it's a matter of two cardioversions or defibrillations, the third will set a stage for myocardial stunning. That is, you're trying to come to a condition where the heart might be getting weaker with every possible shock. But what to do? Now, if you have a VF patient who is not responding, is unconscious, you don't have a PT, you don't have a BP, then you continue with CPR. You continue shocking till you have either some benefit or you have enough time to make sure that the acidosis or the electrolyte ambulance or whatever it is, is being looked at, is, has taken care of. So, so there's something called a VT storm a word where you are not able to do anything. But that is rare circumstance where your defibrillation might just fail. But after two, in fact, they say between two to three, you are not probably looking at a successful cardioversion or defibrillation, except in cases of VF where you probably will be looking at more number of uh, shocks. But in cardioversion, if it's a more of an elective case, you don't give it to more than two or maximum of three under uh, IV amiodron or IV beta blocker or you know a more of sedation so whatever you want to do you 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 just you just uh, you know stay put at around maximum of two or maximum of three that's it thank you thank you very much <clears throat> yes question question um so i wanted to uh to share this uh, with you all, you had spoken about uh, biphasic versus monophasic. I just think this is a good way to kind of visualize the effectiveness of a biphasic waveform over monophasic. So this is good. the total amount of energy required to cardiovert a heart. And this study mm -hmm. shows that having a either an equal phase, so first phase, second phase being equal length of about five milliseconds a piece, or having a longer first phase is shown to be superior to a monophasic. So total joules or total voltage required to defibrillate. And keep in mind that monophasic, not only are you giving more voltage, so you're causing more electroporation or damage to the heart tissue, but monophasic yeah. itself at an equal energy output is shown to put more, uh, do more damage to the heart. So um, a big reason why, if you have both options in your hospital, um, I would say you may want to default. I'm not a physician, but you may want to look for the biphasic opportunity. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you. much, sir. And then one more we had spoken about um, ATP or anti-tachycardial pacing. This may be a little bit in the weeds, but 
uh, basically just showing how an electrical circuit can be interrupted with ATP. So just going 20 to 30 milliseconds faster than the cycle length or the total time between um, either ventricular events or atrial events that you're trying to break up and gaining control of that um, refractory period and overdriving it, hopefully pace terminating the rhythm. Yeah, uh, I would like to add one thing in this. Uh, this is one function which is available in ICDs and CRTDs. Mm -hmm. Pacemakers usually, uh, you know, when you talk of the word ATP, they, they, they somehow have uh, less of it. But yes, when you are looking at a monomorphic VT circuit, you have, uh, you know, your uh, devices uh, giving you those uh, papers with that morphology. You can actually go ahead and uh, the device does it for you, but again, you can also do it in refractory VTs. Mm -hmm. To add as well, if they ever have a slower VT, you can use a pacemaker as a way to overdrive by programming the rate faster than the intrinsics. Okay. So there is obviously okay. limitations with how fast a pacemaker can pace, but if they have a VT at 120, you can program them at 130 and leave it for a period of time programmed at <laughs> drop the rate down and see if you've managed to pace terminate. Um, yes. Obviously you want yes. to have uh, defibrillation available just in case you initiate something worse, so. Okay, uh, uh, AJ. Yes, sir. Yeah, can you explain the difference between bus and RAM? Between what, I'm sorry? Burst and bus and RAM. Um, he's, that... he's talking of the trains of stimuli. Oh, oh, gotcha. Um, yeah. So essentially ramping is your, um, if you're looking at the cycle length of the uh, cardiac cycle with a ramp. So with the typical ATP, right, they're all the same cycle length in between these individual okay. pulses. With ramp within each train of bursts, it gets a little bit shorter every time. So it's just a more aggressive way to try to interrupt to interrupt the rhythm. Uh, that's not very well drawn, but basically instead of having this equal timing between each uh, electrical impulse with ramp, mm. you're shortening that up. Um, so when you give ATP, you give it in a train or a bunch of electrical impulses to try to gain control of the um, of the myocardium, right? Um, and then there's different ways you can kind of program within each of those trains to make it more aggressive. Yes, they, between, yes because, like, sorry. Because during the programming, you hmm. see boss, maybe they put it to three, RAM, maybe two. Yeah, exactly. So you have, you have different options um, and we can kind of go into that in more detail, I think later, but like the real premise is with ATP, you're not, there's more complexity if you'd like to be more aggressive with your programming. And this is in within defibrillators, obviously. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. You wouldn't, you wouldn't do like surface. I don't know. I've never surface sure, sure, sure. like that, sure. but, um, but yeah, so there's, there's different ways to kind of customize your ATP. So ramp is fairly aggressive. I would say I never use it typically and except in very specific cases where it's shown to be effective for a specific patient. Um, okay will seem like adaptive where it'll re-measure the cycle length um, of the last um, event after the first train of, so you give a train of ATP, it doesn't work. It'll re-measure the cycle length and it will adapt it to be a little bit shorter or a little more aggressive. Um, but ramp is within each um, train and it's a fairly aggressive way of, you know, giving ATP and it can be giving very- ATP, okay. Yeah. So you want to be ready to defibrillate in those cases because you could put them into an arrhythmia, a worse arrhythmia. Okay. Um, uh, Amit, uh, Dr. Amitesh, can you explain this um, wearable cardioverter defibrillator? Which one? I didn't get your question. Wearable. Wearable cardioverter. A uh, wearable. He's like a Zol. Yeah. Yes. yes. So this has come up now in 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 circumstances where you have uh, you know the patient is not willing for an endocardial placing placement. There are defibrillators available which you can wear. Where they are uh, you know a bit uh, annoying sometimes. But again, you have to understand that the impedance of the chest wall needs to be taken care of. So they are more uh, 
you know specific for an individual and in rhythms in in cases where you know that the hemodynamic compromise might be there but the patient is not willing for an endocardial uh, icd you can actually go ahead with a, a variable cardioverter defibrillator defibrillator okay to add to that point, um, you may also see it sometimes for like bridges during extractions. So a patient has an infected device and they don't re-implant right away. They may mm. give them a wearable just for the time as they get the infection under control before re-implant. Okay. So uh, there's no specific indication apart from being that uh, you can use it as a bridge before uh, implant of uh, ICD. So it, it's it not for a long term. Is it for a long term use like an ICD? In patients who have, you know, very few recurrences, you know, once in a year, once in two years, you can give them that option. But again, you have to understand that wearable ICDs are, you know, they might not pace once they give a shock. You know, the post pacing yes. radies are not taken care of with wearable ICDs. All so right. there are a few options available in people who are very you know, stable, very less uh, frequency of uh, you know, the, the ventricular rhythms. There are, there is, there is a specific reason for you to give a variable ICD uh, than the usual one, the endocardial ones. Correct. Thank you, sir. Something, there is something that used to be available earlier was something called an internal cardioverters. So, you yes. know, in patients who are undergoing bypass grafting and the chest is opened up, you suddenly find that the fibrillation, the ventricular fibrillation has come into play. So there were paddles which were earlier used. You could use it on, you know, in, in your vision to keep, it, keep them on the epicardial surface of the heart and defibrillate because you cannot use, a, you cannot use the paddles because the chest is opened up. So those are circumstances uh, which are which are called the emergent, uh, you know, post-surgical complications can happen, but you need to be ready for them. Okay. Thank you. Here's a. You were talking about like when they're open. You may have seen some of these in the past too. Uh, yeah, possibly, yeah. so patients or chests are already open. They may choose to yes. implant. And oh. Patients. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Asia, we don't have them in uh, in in Nigeria. Hmm. We don't have them here. The uh, the sewn on, but yeah, I I you don't see them much in America either. It's pretty rare. A lot of times we just we implant some transvenous. Um, but okay. back in the day, people used to do that. You may have also seen arrays. You may have opportunities to use arrays um, where they would do like a it would go to an implantable defibrillator in the chest, mm. then you would have um, underneath the skin, you'd have like an array that would allow you to defibrillation. Um, so you have like uh, ICDs, for example, use those kind of yeah. methods. And then also you have opportunities to use like a um, different positioning coils. We'll go over that a different day. I don't think that subject matter needs to cover. So. No, uh, in addition to this, do you probably have yeah. the subcutaneous ICD as well from Boston? Um, again, People who are in a position um, to carry them, carry it on the chest wall, perhaps in people who have, uh, you know, venous access issues, in people who have had prior infections, you're probably looking at a subcutaneous ICD as well. Yeah. Yes, very important. Please, can you just throw some light on the sub uh, subcut ICDs? No, this is what, this is what makes them different from the transvenous implanted yeah, ICDs. You're not, you're not going endocardial. You yes. are looking at a vector from the outside of the heart. But you're doing the same job an ICD does. So the amount of energy delivered, amount of work that you do, it's you know uh, somewhere between your back and between your front, you create a pocket for that big machine. And the vector is placed close to the heart subcutaneously, which keeps it going. But again, the issues are the same as your uh, variable ones, you know, the post cardiac pacing. Sometimes you require them, you, you cannot do that. It's just about providing you with a shock whenever the need arises. Okay. 
That, who it, big uh, it, do you require the assistance of the uh, of the surgeon? No, we've done it. Otherwise, it is possible. It's just that it needs a bit more of planning. Okay. It needs a bit more of planning. You need to, you need to, uh, you know, tell the patient that this is perhaps the way we are going to do it, and this mm -hmm. is these are the the precautions you need to take, and this is the way we are going to proceed, and this is you know, it stays the same as an endocardial one, but it just that you need to, uh, you know, uh, uh, sharpen your surgical skills a bit more. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, very, very important. I would, um, so, I'll go ahead and show this just in case you may find it interesting. So we speak about like different arrays. Um, and obviously, uh, I think Julius and I can cover this on a different day where we're talking about defibrillators. But just to give you an idea, this patient has had many, many different revisions and work done. Um, you can see an RV coil here. You can see an asthma yeah. coil, which is a more posterior position through the asthma vein that gives you a different vector. And then these are actually would be arrays that are uh, subcutaneous. Here's another example, subcutaneous array. So this is all just trying to get a better vector of the heart. So when we talked about earlier, um, you were talking about putting patches on and paddles on, getting the proper vector. It's something to consider as well for internal defibrillators. Um, if you have a massive heart, then one RV coil you know, this vector may not be enough to engage enough tissue. So um, that's why they may try to bring in like an azacus coil that gives you a more posterior um, aspect here. So you can gauge all the tissue from, you know, the RV to the more uh, posterior uh, vector there. No, um, AJ, please explain it again. Um, yeah, so... Basically, let me let me bring it back up. Sorry, I stopped sharing. Um, so basically, in general, when just like with your patches, you want to have a good vector to engage as much cardiac tissue as possible. And there's considerations about where you'll put it. So some of these patients with extremely dilated hearts, or uh, they could have, mm -hmm. um, you know, very, very muscular hearts, um, they it, it kind of hard to defibrillate those. And we don't really DFT or defibrillation threshold test anymore. A lot of, they used to do it at implants or post implant to make sure the device could function. Nowadays, people just receive a device and they just send them out in the world and hope that it works. And statistically it will, but yes. there are patients who may have trouble. So in these cases, if you know they're gonna be difficult or they've had failed shocks in the past, you can bring them in and try to add different hardware to get a little better vector. Um, so there are ways you can program within the device, and I can't really speak to the other manufacturers, but within Abbott, that's where we can play with the bi the biphasic waveform and how long you give each uh, phase. So you can kind of try to cater that to the patient, which is what we call DEFT, D-E-F-T, within Abbott. Um, other companies have some degree of programmability that I'll let someone else talk about. Um, and then there's also ability to add hardware. This is obviously a little more invasive, so if we can program it within the device first, that's ideal. And then if not, we can come in and say, do we add an array? Um, do we add, you know, a Azagus coil? There are lots of different things, but um, it's all just trying to get the best outcome for the patient. And so on patches is always a backup, but you have to end up splitting the chest. So um, it's a lot more invasive than adding an array or adding an Azagus coil. Okay. <clears throat> wow. No, wow. This, this aspect is... Uh well taken care of but again as an interventional cardiologist you're probably looking at a dual chamber ICDs in large hearts and assuming that they'll play their part before taking uh, you know the, the, the route for the coil because sometimes you you have this option of putting in a dual coil ICD lead the one which is there in the zygus and so that's in the, in the RV uh, RV so uh, as as people who can, you know, the, the first option is also always going to be what you can do endocardially and perhaps go into a more uh, invasive uh, need if, if, if uh, you know, uh, time and the other things permit. Absolutely. Okay. Hello. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I just have a question regarding um, surgical invasive uh, 
intracardiac defibrillation, um, post op or intra op. Um, if we can perhaps throw some light on that, you know, after the bypass surgery or any of the cardiac surgeries where they have to stop the heart and they need to defibrillate to bring it back up or something, how do we, you know, that set up, what do we do? What's the usual thing or what's recommended? Yeah, so we have paddles available to be kept on the epicardial surface of the heart when there is, uh, you know, VFib detected or perhaps even a TDP or a polymorphic PD, whatever it is, and you have a hemodynamic compromise. But I'm not sure if that's available, uh, you know, um, that frequently because those centers which have a massive volume of bypasses, well, we have them. So that's what I'm saying. So it's all about the center itself where you, while, you know, uh, on patient on table, intubated, still goes up as a VFib, there are, there are uh, ways to defibrillate if required. Yes, we, we do have them. We have those uh, paddles as well as the, the, the cables the, that makes it compatible with the defibrillator. Yes. We have yeah. them in our center, but yeah. the guidelines on just want to be aware what to do or how is it done. You know, I'm not familiar with that space yet, but since so I have there's a there's a specific set of technical requirements while the patient has been opened up. You you have to be ready for all cases. So there's a specific group of technical uh, people always ready with those paddles in case there's a, a VFib. Again, these are not in the guidelines because once you are once you opened up the chest and you are uh, you know. The usual circumstances will be once you are, once you are uh, on a on a pump and you know both off pump or on pump, you've taken care of this wifi part. But again, arrhythmias can happen anytime. So there's a technical team which is always ready with those paddles, and uh, in case required, you do wifi uh, Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um. AJ, AJ, do you have something else to share with us? Amitesh, you have something else to share with us? Um, we have, have we finished dealing with the topic? Defibrillation, cardiovascular? If, if there are no questions, uh, if there are no doubts, I think we have. I don't have any slides as of now. Yeah. <clears throat> so I've shared the slides in the um in the group uh, is i i need to make some modification but i just share it we can those of us who wants to go through it uh because we have our fellows from here too who are interested in much about it if you have any questions you can post it in the group you can post it to uh dr amitesh uh, dr amitesh is in the group you yeah. can get his number from the group yeah, you can ask him any question. If you want to ask AJ, you can ask AJ any question. You can ask Elvis, you can ask me. Uh, the aim is for us to really understand these things and how they work and how we can get our patient managed better. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's already, I can see that it's uh, after 12 in Delhi, five minutes past 12 in Delhi. Yeah. We've gone past 12. Sorry, we have kept you awake. Now. <laughs> yes. It was good. Yeah, it was good. In, uh, it's good. So why in Nigeria here, you think it's 7.30, we have spent an hour, 30 minutes uh, going through this topic. Uh, we have our teacher here also, um, uh, Dr. Oga. Dr. Oga was one time uh, the uh the president of the nigerian cardiac society a very seasoned cardiology is my is my teacher is still my teacher to date he's here i don't know whether he will have a question uh you will have a contribution to us on this topic we just discussed 
Sorry, doctor. Uh, thank you very much. Um, actually, driving. thank you, sir. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, I joined nice. late. I joined late, so I want to thank uh, our teachers from outside the country. But uh, I would like to get the slides as well um, because I had another meeting, so I couldn't join at the beginning of the of the meeting. Thank you so thank much you. for thank you, boss. For this session. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. A very humble teacher and a great man indeed. So we have shared the slides in the group already. Good. So Perfect. I posted the slide in the, in the group. Perfect. So AJ, oh. you are taking next week. Thank you. Yes, sir. AJ, you have a topic next week, sir. Yeah, you I think. And, um, and uh, uh, Jared. Uh, Ask Julius. Yeah, you, Julius. You and yeah. Jared, well, Julius, yeah, Julius will moderate.